Well, good evening, everyone. We want to give you a warm welcome to our service this evening. And for those folk who are joining with us online in your own homes, we want to give you a special welcome. And Lord, uh, we do pray as we come into the presence of the Lord tonight uh, that we will all receive a blessing, uh, whether you're here or whether you're in your home. So, uh, big welcome to Josh. Now, I know if I don't see Mike here tonight, but if Mike was here, he quite often he talks about something. Uh, but I uh, don't want to embarrass Josh tonight by mentioning it, uh, and so we'll, we'll not talk about the football at all. <laughs> so, Josh, very welcome. Uh, and we're going to sing a couple of choruses uh, as we start. So just keep your seats as we sing. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. sing again another chorus, and as you are my strength when I am weak, you are the treasure that I seek, you are my all in all, seeking you as a precious jewel, Lord, to give you up I'd be a fool, you are my all in all. Let's think on these words as we sing them. Thank you, Betty. Thank you, Bond. 
Uh, we're going to just bring the announcements now. Uh, so, uh, next weekend is our harvest weekend. So, tomorrow night is the last choir practice for the harvest, and that's at 8 p.m. Then on Tuesday morning, uh, Mums and Tots is normal, so we do need your help tonight to clear the hall and bring the toys out. That would be appreciated. Tuesday evening, also at 8 p.m., there's a Dickens meeting. Then Wednesday evening is our prayer meeting, as normal, 8 p.m., so make an effort to be there. It's important. Tuesday morning, our prayer meeting at 10 a.m., and then next Friday evening, Pathfinders and Straight Youth as normal at 7 and 8.15. Uh, as I mentioned, next Sunday is a harvest. So, uh, regarding drop-off uh, items for the harvest to uh, decorate the church can be dropped off on Friday evening, and then on Saturday morning uh, is a set-up uh, for the harvest. And then on the Monday, uh, help would be appreciated to, to distribute and uh, whatever's here. Uh, so, back to, then to next Sunday. Uh, as I said, it's our harvest service, but Sunday school is normal at 10.15, and our special speaker for the harvest services is Simon Walsh from the Faith Mission. So, uh, let's hope next weekend will be a special weekend for us. Uh, also, from the members' meeting this past week, uh, Brian McFall and John Strange were re-elected to the Dagonet. Uh, next Sunday night, after the evening service, is the Youth Fellowship, so bear that in mind, please, uh, next week. And after the service this evening, there's going to be a cup of tea, so if you can. Now, I know Josh has to rush away for their Youth Fellowship, so uh, we understand that. So, we're going to stand now and sing our first hymn. There's a sound on the wind like a victory song. Listen now, let it rest on your soul. It's a song that I learned from a heavenly king. It's the song of a battle royal. Right, let's stand and, and sing as best we can uh, this hymn tonight.
Thank you. Now we're, we're going to come to the throne of God in prayer. Let's pray. Father, as we come into your presence tonight, we do thank you for the promise where two or three are gathered together that you are in the midst. So, Lord, as we meet in your presence tonight, we pray that we would be aware of your presence. Lord, we pray that all aspects of this service would be pleasing to you and glorifying to you, Lord, as we lifted our voices to you in song. Lord, we do pray for Josh tonight as he brings your message to us, Lord. We pray that you would help him and give him liberty tonight, Lord. Lord, we do remember those folk in their own homes who are tuning into us. We pray indeed that you would bless them there and help them. Lord, we do remember those who can't be with us tonight because of uh, infirmities or other problems. And Lord, we do remember them. And Lord, we do thank you for the privilege that we have of gathering together with the freedom we have in this country, Lord, and how you have blessed us, Lord, that we can meet like this, none daring to make us afraid. And Lord, we do remember our brothers and sisters around this world of ours, Lord, where they can't meet in such freedom. And Lord, we do lift them up before you tonight. And Lord, we do pray for them. And Lord, we think of the trouble spots and uh, lands where persecution is rife. And yet, Lord, we have it so easy here. And Lord, we pray indeed that uh, indeed you, you would meet with us tonight. In your name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Now, we're going for a Bible reading, and hopefully I'll come up on the screen. I have the Bible open, for it, but I forgot my glasses, so I'm going to have to read it off the screen. <laughs> it's Psalm 103, so it'll be on the screen, or you can turn it out if you want. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will He keep His anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is His mercy towards those who fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has He removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear Him. For He knows our frame, and He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourishes. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him, and his righteousness to children's children, to such as keep his covenant and to those who remember His commandments to do them. The Lord has established His throne in heaven, and His kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, you His angels, who excel in strength, who do His word, heeding the voice of His word. Bless the Lord, all you His hosts, you ministers of His who do His pleasure. 
Bless the Lord all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And we pray that God will bless the public reading of his word. We're going to sing again, and at the end of this, we'll hand over uh, to Josh. We need to congratulate Josh on becoming a dad since the last time we had him here, and Rose is with him here tonight. I think she's in the uh, soft seated room with Phoebe. So congratulations, Josh, and we're good to see, it's good to see a new generation of Patterson here tonight. So after this, Josh will hand over to you. So turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And we'll stand to sing, please.
Well, <clears throat> good evening, everybody. It's uh, lovely to see you out here this evening, and it's lovely to be here uh, again, just to be able to share uh, God's Word with you. I was going to make jokes about the football, but then I thought it's just still too raw and too sore, uh, so we'll not bother. But it's lovely to be here, and I'm uh, and, and looking forward to uh, what the Lord is going to say to us uh, this evening. And if you have your Bible with you, and it should come on the screen as well, we're going to turn back to the book of Psalms, and, uh, and we're going to go to Psalm 25, and uh, it's uh, 22 verses long, and we'll take time just to read it uh, all uh, together. <clears throat> psalm 25, and uh, it's a psalm of David, and he writes, Psalm 25, "'To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exalt over me. Uh, indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame.' They shall all be ashamed who are wantingly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you, o God, uh, you, o God of, you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me. For the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore He instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble His way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep His covenant and His testimonies. For Your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. Who is the man who fears the Lord? Him will He instruct in the way that He should choose. His soul shall abide in well-being and His offspring shall inherit the land. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear Him, and He makes known to them His covenant. My eyes are ever towards the Lord, for He will pluck my feet out of the net. Turn to me and be gracious, o, o, turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Bring me out of my distresses. Consider my affliction and my trouble, and forgive all my sins. Consider how many are my foes, and with what violent hatred they hate me. O oh, guard my soul and deliver me. Let me not be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. Redeem Israel, O oh God, out of all his troubles. And we trust God will bless uh, the reading of his word uh, to us. This is again a short prayer before we come to think about these things. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your word. And Lord, thank You that uh, through it and in it is everything that we would need to understand for this life and for eternity. And so again, Lord, we thank You. Thank You uh, for this psalm. We pray that, Lord, as we think about it, that, Lord, You'd be speaking to us and You would help us to understand what it is that You're trying to say to us. And Father, I pray that as we leave, we would just be encouraged, remembering and knowing uh, the, the amazing God that we have who is with us through whatever we would go through. Also, Lord, we pray now that you'd be speaking in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, the title I put on this sermon, sometimes titles are helpful, is uh, Dealing with the Storms uh, of Life. And to get an idea of storms in our mind, we probably don't need to go uh, much further than the events of this past week uh, in Florida with Hurricane Milton, I think it was called. And so, uh, we've seen sort of these kind of pictures on the, on the TV, winds of over 120 mile an hour, there's flash floods, there's 18 inches of, of rainfall that fell in, in a matter of hours, something like 200,000 plus residents of Florida had to get out of their houses and get evacuated. And what did the, what did the storm do when it came? Well, it just left complete carnage in, in its wake. Uh, a proper storm, we would say, a proper storm. Now, um, we probably will never get caught in a storm physically just like a, as bad as that is in Florida, but I think we all come to understand something of the storms that we face in life. They, they, it just, whatever it may be, it brings destruction, and, uh, and, and when it moves on, we're just left sort of thinking, well, what do I do now? How do I clear up this mess? Uh, what's going to happen? And I think when we turn to Psalm 25 with David, I think he's facing one of life's big storms. And it's hard to know, we can't exactly know what he's facing because he doesn't exactly tell us. Uh, it's not recorded. We have a fair idea, but we get the sense that he's just, 
this thing has come into his life, and he's left feeling like there's just destruction, havoc, and carnage, and that's what he's left with. Um, but what I want to do this evening is just go through this psalm and see how David copes with this storm that he has given. There's a number of things we can learn uh, as we travel through, uh, as we travel through uh, our lives facing our storms. I think there's a fair bit that we can learn from here. Not that we're holding David up as on a pedestal saying we should be like him, but rather we're saying David trusted in God. God hasn't changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so we too uh, can look to him. I think it's important to say uh, just on the outset that this, this psalm has 22 verses, and it's an acrostic, um, which is pretty common in Hebrew poetry, although I don't know much about it, but each verse starts with an intentional letter, and uh, there's 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet, and so each verse starts with the, the going basically A, B, C, but in the Hebrew uh, alphabet. And now for the Israel, Israelite people, that was great. That helped it stick in their minds. We don't see that so much, so it doesn't really make sense to us. Um, and when, it, when they put it in an acrostic, it doesn't come through with a real flow. It kind of seems like David is jolting here and there. And uh, Sinclair Ferguson, he described it as rather than like a, a straight line uh, on a graph, uh, he, he describes it more as like a spiral case uh, going, circling around the same issue. So it's kind of maybe not easy to follow David's train of thought, but I want to just pull it out and try and make it make sense of this uh, that we might uh, understand what's going on. But David is definitely going through the mill. That's where he's at. He's got a number of problems. Um, I think the first problem that we see uh, is, his, is that he's struggling with past sin. Um, we see there verse 6 and 7 and verses 18 uh, tell us that he, he says, uh, remember not the sins of my youth and, and my transgressions. Uh, he, and he says, according to the steadfast love, remember your mercy. Um, turn to me and be gracious to me. And I don't think David has, some, has done something major that's sinful. Uh, I think, and, 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 now, and now he's confronted with it, but rather I think at the end of his life or towards the end of his life as he looks back and he sees all that he's done, it seems like he's just hit afresh with just the weight of sin in his life. He recognizes that if God is to keep a track of, of every sin that David has committed and all the actions that David has done that has been wrong, then David has absolutely no excuse. David is 100% guilty, and whatever punishment would come his way, he deserves it. And so he's pleading with God that he wouldn't remember the sins of his past. His second problem is that he seems to be facing enemies of some kind. Verse 2 says, uh, indeed, um, he says, end of, yeah, verse 2, let not my enemies exalt over me. We can't again be 100% sure what's going on. It could be that he's on the run from Saul when he's writing this. Um, Saul is, has made him sort of leader of his armies, but then Saul gets jealous of him and runs after him. But because it's probably written at the end of his life, David is probably more concerned, um, is, is more likely to be in the situation where his son Absalom has decided that he wants to be king instead of David. And so what does he do? Well, he chases David out of Jerusalem, and David has to leave his home, his house, uh, all his servants, all of his stuff, and get out of there. And so David knows what it is to be hated. He knows, he knows what it is to be wished for as dead, and he has to flee, and he has to survive. So David is facing some sort of, of enemies. Thirdly, a big thing that David is struggling with here is guidance. He says in verse 4, he says, make me to know your thoughts, teach me your paths. In verse 5, he says, lead me and teach me. In verse 8, he says, God instructs sinners in the way. In verse 9, he says, he leads the humble, he teaches uh, in his way. Verse 10, all the paths of the Lord. Verse 12, him he will instruct in the way. And what's more unlikely here for David is that he just has a desire to know what is God doing? What is God doing? What's God's plan here? God, what are your thoughts? God, what are your ways? God, what you're doing in my life doesn't make sense. If he's on the run from Saul or Absalom, well, he's promised to be king. He knows that God has anointed him to be king. So why is this happening? Why is Saul going after him to kill him? It could be, uh, yeah, it could be that uh, Absalom is, is trying to kill him, his own son. He's thinking, Lord, why is this happening to me? And David's felt like, God, what are you doing? He's obeyed God, 
and yet he's experiencing nothing but problems. God, show me your ways, your paths, that I may get a way out of this situation. He's seeking to understand what are God's purposes in these situations. I think it's something we all feel from time to time, isn't it? We face a storm, we think, God, what are you doing? Why is this happening? I don't see any purpose in it. Well, that's how David's feeling, crying out to God, Lord, teach me your ways that I might understand what's going on here. And so then we got to think, well, what's David's response to all this trouble that he's experiencing? What does he do to, to know that he's forgiven? What does he do to seek protection from his enemies? What does he do to find guidance from God? And when we're in a storm, whatever that may be, it may not be because of our past sin or because of our enemies or because we're struggling with guidance. It could be some of those things. But what you're facing might be different from that. But I still think we can ask the question, um, like, what, what, what can we do? What, what do we need to do in, while we're in these storms? I think with David here, we see three things that he does in the midst of his storm that we can apply to our own lives, that whenever we would be feeling like we're going through the mill and things are not making sense and we're struggling whether it was sin or enemies or whatever it may be, what we're to do in the future, there's three things I think we can, we can sort of apply to our own lives that David does as he looks to the Lord. The first one is simply this. It's not rocket science. Tell our problems to God. What does David do from the very outset? In, in, in verse 1, to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. David's first port of call when he's in trouble isn't to look inward to himself. It's not to look out to his army. It's not to look out to his own strength and what he can do and his money and his wealth and whatever he has. No, but he looks up to Almighty God and he tells him his problems and he trusts him to show David what the way forward is. He looks to bring his problems before God in prayer. I kind of have in the image of my, in my head of, of like a small child or something running uh, in a park, and they fall over and they graze their knee, and yeah, friends are there, but they're not enough. Other adults are there, they're not enough, but they go running looking for mom. Mom can sort this situation out. Well, what does David do? He recognizes only God can sort out these situations, that, 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 that a solution cannot be found anywhere else. And whatever it is that you're facing tonight, whatever it is that's on your heart, whatever it is that keeps you up at night and goes over and over in your head, whatever it is that you're struggling with, the same thing applies. What are we to do? We're not to try and sort the problem out ourselves. We're not to try and look to our own strength. We're not to try and look to what we can do, but rather we're to take our problems to God. And it doesn't just need to be the big problems that we face. Sometimes I think, I know in my own life, I think, well, the small problems I'll deal with, but if there's a big major life decision, I'll take that to God. Now, God cares about all the problems that we're facing and that you're facing uh, tonight. I think as, as part of his prayer, it's interesting that he's, David is seeking, he's seeking to know what, like what, what the Lord is doing and what God's plan is. And so what is, he prays in verse 4, and verse 5, he says, make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. The sense of those verses is not so much David is asking God for a very specific answer to this very specific situation, but rather David recognizes if he could just understand more about how God normally works and about how, if, how, how God usually directs, if he could know the, pla the, the paths and the ways and the truths of God better, He would be blessed. I think for most decisions that you and I make, from the small ones right the way to the big ones, um, that, that God has given us to something uh, to say. God has said something to all of those different situations. He has given us His ways, His paths, and His, uh, and His truths. Questions like, what job should I have? Where should I live? Who should I marry? How should I raise children? How do I cope with my family and my friends and issues there? How do I cope with issues that are at school, that I've got going on at school? Uh, how, do I cope, how do I cope with issues at work? Well, God has already shown His basic direction for you and for me. I would say at least 90% of the answer, God has already 
given us. As we turn to God and we pray and we bring Him our troubles and our problems, we've got to do that as we're reading the Word of God. I 100% believe that God can speak by His Holy Spirit to us into our hearts with a very specific situation. We may not have the Bible open, and the Spirit can just speak right to you. I believe that. But in my experience, 95% of the time, when I need direction from God, the Holy Spirit speaks to me as I'm reading the Word of God. As David, as David is praying, he desires that God would show him his path and his ways more clearly. Listen, if you want to know God's paths and God's ways and the way He wants to lead you, you've got to open the Bible and you've got to be reading it. And in whatever trouble you face, whether it's big or small, God will be able to direct you and give you some guidance as you lift up your burden to Him and as you read His Word. As you, maybe you're thinking about what school does my child need or maybe it needs to change school. What do we do? Well, we pray and we read. Who am I to marry? What do we do? We pray and we read. How am I, how, God, how can I serve you more? We pray and we read. Lord, how should I run my business? God's answer is, well, pray and read His Word. God, what do I do for my elderly parents? We pray about it and we go to His Word. God, what should I do with my retirement? Pray and read. You get the idea. Whatever is going on in our life, the first thing we have to do is tell our problems to God. And then when we've done that, when we open up His Word and spend time in it and praying, then more than likely God will give you some direction as to where, you go, where, to, where you're to go and what you're to do. Now, part of the praying process is waiting. It doesn't all happen in an instant. But God can lead you, and God can direct you, and God can guide you as you tell him your problems, and as you open up His Word. So, that's the first thing. What does David do? Well, he tells his problems to God. The second thing is this. He remembers uh, what God is like. After he prays, David takes a moment to turn to God and just to remember exactly what this God is like. We see God's character throughout this whole psalm. Verse 5, he says, "'You are the God of my salvation.'" Verse 6, he says, mercy instead, God is a God of mercy and steadfast love. Further on, he says, a God of the old, a God of old like faithful, a God who is good, a God who is upright, a God who leads sinners, a God who leads people in the right way to go, a God who leads His people in ways that are full of love and faithfulness, a God that, that will give a, a land to those who, inherit, or those who obey Him and keep His promises, a God who can lift me out of the net that I'm caught in and he's bigger than all of my problems. And so, David is going right through the very epicenter of this massive storm in his life. And what does he do? Well, he looks immediately. He doesn't look at what's going on around him. He doesn't look at his situation, and he doesn't dwell on his situation. But what does he do? He looks up to the God that he's told his problems to, and the God who is bigger than this situation that he is in. As long as David can focus on God and not on the situation that he's in, he knows he's going to be okay. Having lived in England most of my life, and we had family over here, as you know, uh, we got the boat from Carn Ryan to Larne. It felt like uh, all the time. And, uh, and it seemed to me like one out of every three times, 33% of the time, it was rough. And I don't really cope well on the rough sea. And, uh, and it just was awful. I just hated it. Couldn't wait to get off. And uh, uh, and anyway, on the topic of seasickness, one article suggests that the main causes of seasickness uh, is the disconnect between what your eyes see and what your inner ear senses. By keeping your eyes on the horizon, you can help your brain reconcile the motion of the boat and the visual input it's receiving. This can be especially helpful when you're first getting used to the boat and your body is still adjusting to the motion. What are they suggesting? They're suggesting that if you put your eyes on the horizon and on the land that doesn't move, then it'll start to, your brain will start to put what's happening around you into perspective. And that is exactly what David is doing. He is keeping his eyes on the rock, on the thing that is steady in his life. He's looking to the Lord. And as he looks to the Lord, everything else around him starts to make sense because his focus is on God. Whatever trouble it is you're facing, stop, we have to stop looking at our problems. 
We've got to look up our, look, lift up our eyes and see a great and an awesome God who puts our problems into perspective because nothing is as powerful as Him. Nothing is as strong as Him. Nothing is bigger than Him. And as David is surrounded by these problems, he asks, well, what is my God like? He says, He's the God of my salvation. He alone has saved me, and He alone has given me an eternity. Um, he saved me from an eternity without Him, and He's going to bring me to a new creation. David recognizes He's a God of mercy and steadfast love. He doesn't just cast me aside like a toy that He's done playing with. No, but His love is forever upon me. He's a God of old. He's faithful. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't grow weary. He doesn't get tired. He doesn't go to sleep for a break. He's a God who's good. All of His motives are good. All of His actions are good. The way that He has for me is good. He's a God who is upright. That means He's pure. There's no wonder the table deals with this God. What He tells me is true, and He's always going to do what it is that He says He's going to do. He's a God who leads sinners. His leading is not dependent on me being good. God answering my prayer and showing me the way forward doesn't require me to be a perfect person because I'll never get there. But He's a God who leads sinners. He leads those who know they're not able. He leads those who know they're not perfect. He leads those who know that they're weak. And He's a God who, uh, who leads people in the ways that, that are full of love and faithfulness just as God is good, so His plans for you and for me are good. He keeps His promises. He's a God who can lift me out of the net that I'm caught in. He's bigger than my problems. He's bigger and more powerful than anything I could face. That is the living God, and that is who we need to have our eyes on and what we need to have our eyes on as we face whatever storms would be going on in our lives. When we're tossed around by the storms of life, and we're wondering, Lord, what are you doing? What's the purpose in this? What's going to happen here? Take our eyes off the storm and look to the one who is in complete control. How do we keep our eyes on God? How do I find out what He's like? Uh, how, how do we get to, well, how do you get to know anybody in a relationship? You got to spend time with them, talking to them, and listening from them. Again, when we pray and when we read God's Word, we begin to understand more and more what this God is like. And as we begin to understand more about what He's like, we'll be less concerned about the problems that we're facing here, and we'll lift up our eyes and see what He is doing. Something I find helpful when I read the Bible, especially because some of the Bible, it can be hard to understand, and it can seem dry, and it can seem like there's God saying nothing. But a good question I always ask myself is, what is God saying about Himself here? Because God's Word is God revealing Himself to us. And so when you're reading the Bible and you're thinking, I'm not getting anything out of this, just ask yourself, what is God, say what is God saying about Himself? What's God revealing about who He is? And then the greater understanding we have of what God is like, the more likely we are to keep our eyes on Him because we know that He's bigger than whatever it is that we're facing. Tell God your problems. Remember what God is like. Thirdly and finally, submit to God's rule. For David to get out of the troubles he's in uh, and to get, uh, or to get through the troubles he's in, he tells God his problems. He takes them to, to God in prayer. Remembers what God is like. He reflects on God's character, who he is. But he recognizes in, who, in light of who God is and, uh, and what God knows, and the power God has, David just needs to step back and give everything over to God. Verse 10 says, all the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep His commandment and His testimonies. Verse 14 says, the friendship, is for the, is, uh, the friendship of the Lord is for those who fear Him, and He makes known to them His covenant. The blessings of this psalm, that we can know God's help as we go through the storm, is for those who fear the Lord. What does it mean to fear the Lord? The Bible talks a lot about that. It simply means to humble yourself in recognition of who we are in comparison to who God is. It goes back really to the first of the Ten Commandments. God said, have no other gods before me. Living a life where God is the big focus. He is calling the shots, and in comparison to Him, I am absolutely nothing. 
And it leads to obeying God. It leads, that attitude leads to obeying God in everything because we're saying, well, what God says is of greater significance to me uh, than what I can say or what I can do. That's David's response. Even though he's going through the storm, even though he's going through the mill, even though he doesn't know how things are going to pan out, with all of the troubles that are raging on in David's life, he says, still, I'm going to humble myself. I'm going to fear the Lord. I will, I'll still follow Him, because in the grand scheme of things, God is big, and this storm and myself, we are nothing, and so I am going to trust Him. That ought to be our attitude during the storm, to say, God, I recognize who You are and what You are like, and compared to what I am and what I am facing, this is nothing. You are so much bigger, so much stronger, and so much better. And what do those who fear the Lord gain? I find this really encouraging, you know. It says, uh, verse 14, uh, it says, the friendship, uh, friendship of the Lord is for those who fear Him. That really means, there might be a note of the, in, your, in your Bible that says, the secret counsel. That, that friendship means the inner secrets of the Lord. What does God do for those who fear Him? He brings them in close that they might, uh, that, 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 that there would be an intimate company between them and God. When we fear God, what does He do? Well, we get to know Him better, and He shares with us His heart. He shares with us what He loves. He shares with us His grace and His mercy so that we're able to call the Lord our friend as He desires to share Himself with us and be close to us and help us. Isn't it amazing that the God of all creation, who made everything, who put the universe together and all the different galaxies together and the vastness of our universe, and yet He desires to share His heart with you and with me. He desires to share Himself with you and with me. And unless we allow the Lord to be number one in our lives, unless we fear Him, We'll never experience this close relationship, and, uh, and one day we'll be cast away from Him forever if we won't let God be first in our lives. We'll never experience the love that He can pour into us, and the peace that He can give, and the joy that He can give. All of that is available, and a, and a closeness with God to the one who would fear Him and put Him first as the big thing. What else do we gain by fearing the Lord? It says, verse 14, he makes known to them His covenant. He makes known to them His covenant. As we seek to live and follow God through the storms of life, and, uh, and we obey what He says, we put Him as number one, we make ourselves small and say, God, You are big, I'm going to follow You. What does He do? Well, He reveals to us, uh, it says there, His covenant. That's His relationship with His people. When we make God number one and we follow Him, He reveals to us more and more and more the basis of our relationship. He shows us in greater and greater measure the love that He has for us. Our relationship with God is not based on our merit or our goodness or our ability to live a perfect life. He makes known to us the covenant between us, and it's all about His love for us. How did He show that love to us? Well, most clearly through the Lord Jesus, dying for us, taking upon Himself our sin and our shame, and giving us His righteousness, and welcoming us into His family. The longer I am a Christian, and I'm not that old, but the longer I am a Christian, I, I find the more amazing the, the, the love of God is for me, because I recognize more and more how sinful I am. I recognize more and more how many times I get things wrong. And the, and, and the longer I'm a Christian, just the more sinful I see myself. And yet God is willing to love me, and God is willing to love you, and that love for you is the basis of, his, of, of the relationship you have between Him and you. So David is struggling, struggling to know whether God or, ha, has or hasn't forgiven his sin. He's struggling to know whether God is going to protect him from his enemies. He's struggling to know what, what God's plans for him are. What does God do? Well, He makes known to him His covenant. David, you're loved with an everlasting love. David, I'm never going to let you go. David, I'm going to be faithful when you're not faithful. 
David, I'm going to be strong and protect you when you're weak and vulnerable. David, I'm going to lead you in a way forward that is good, just as I am good, even though you might not see what that way is. If you're a Christian, God does the same thing for you. You are loved beyond anything we could ever explain. You are loved with, a, with an indescribable love. And, and in that love, God is going to lead you and guide you and will show you the way forward. So, whatever storm it is that you're facing, tell your problems to the Lord. Open up His Word that you might receive from Him some direction. Remember what God is like. Remember that He is far bigger than any storm you could face. And thirdly, submit to God's rule, knowing that whatever He has planned for you is better than anything you could do yourself. Be willing to step back and say, God, you're big. I'm small. I'm going to follow whatever it is that you want of me. In the storms and the troubles, in the valleys of life, uh, when the way out and the way forward isn't clear, what do we do? Tell God our troubles. Remember what He's like and submit to His rule. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we again just want to thank You this evening for what a wonderful God You are. Thank You that You don't leave Your people. You don't save us and then leave us on our own. But Lord, for Your people, You lead them and You guide them. And Lord, as long as we are looking to You and not looking to ourselves, oh Father, as long as we're reading Your Word and seeking to hear from You, oh Lord, the way becomes clear. That doesn't mean the troubles completely disappear, but Lord, You give us the peace and the, and the joy and a comfort through the storm that nothing else could give. Lord, we want to thank You and praise You for what an amazing God You are. I pray for us, Lord, as we head out into this week, whatever that may hold for us. Some of us will be going through valleys, and some of them will be deep valleys. Oh, Lord, help us to remember to bring our problems to You. Remember that You're bigger than the storm. And Lord, because You're bigger, be willing just to submit to whatever it is You would have us do, and wherever it is You would have us go. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, let's uh, stand together and sing as we close, may the peace of God, our Heavenly Father, and the grace of Christ the risen Son, and the fellowship of God the Spirit keep our hearts and minds within His love. to Him who is able to keep you from stumbling and present you blameless before the presence of His glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. <clears throat>